<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Breakfast Club and to our first returning guest, Dr. Rebecca Johnson, co-director of our Citizen Science Program. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hi, Laurel. Hi. Uh, so Rebecca was last year talking about citizen science and how to use our iNaturalist app to explore nature and um, make observations that actually help scientists, regardless of whether you have any idea what you're looking at. Uh, but today we're pivoting to something small, squishy, uh, ridiculously beautiful, delightfully sneaky. What we're talking about is nudibranchs, AKA sea slugs. And if you're watching right now, you're either already totally in love with nudibranchs or you have no idea what we're talking about, but you're <laughs> about to be in love with nudibranchs. Um, and in fact, nudibranchs are so incredible that this is just one part of a two part series. So Rebecca is going to give you nudibranch 101 today. And then Allison Young, our co-director of citizen science, is going to, on Friday, take you uh, virtually tide pooling. And she's going to let you know what kind of nudibranchs you can find in California and also just best practices for finding them no matter where you are. And, uh, and actually, Rebecca, before we uh, go on, how did you fall in love with nudibranchs? And like, what was it that got you? Yeah, um, I think the thing that really first got me was the amazing, um, their amazing colors and the that they use their colors as a kind of defense, kind of like um, if you think of butterflies, like some people know the story of you know the monarch and viceroy butterfly that one that they share a common color pattern and one is um, poisonous and one is not, and they have these mimicry complex that um, the predators, their predators encounter that pattern more often, so they learn to avoid it. Um, even though one of the butterflies isn't poisonous at all, and nudibranchs kind of do the same thing. So that was the thing that hooked me. Um, but the first time I ever really saw and held a nudibranch was um, up here in Bodega um, in Sonoma County, north of San Francisco. And I remember finding it and just we were collecting. And so like, I remember holding it like we were on a bus and like holding it in this jar and this bus like the whole way home, like just watching it forever. and. Um, it led to a project that I did um, my senior year in college that I'm gonna talk about. Oh, awesome. I remember, I think, so I saw obviously like a lot of photos of nudibranchs before I actually ever saw one in the wild. Yeah. And I didn't understand, and I know they're all different sizes and stuff, but I really didn't understand scale. And I was yeah. thinking of them as like, I don't know, like quite quite like large. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I remember seeing one for the first time in person and I it just was like, such a tiny little treasure that my brain just kind of exploded. And I was just like, uh, it's perfect. It's like a perfect yeah. picture. It's like uh, a little jewel. I mean, I think like yeah. when you pictures, like you'll see them on my first slide, like I show lots of photos of nudibranchs and people, you know, the most common question is how big is it? Because people think it's like, yeah, you can really hold it and see it. And there are some big nudibranchs, but usually they're so small that it's yeah. just extra amazing. Yeah, tiny, tiny yeah. treasures. Tiny, um, tiny. All right. Yeah, well, I'm super excited for this one and um, I'll hand it over. But before I do, just a reminder to anyone watching live that whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can leave questions for Rebecca anytime you want just by typing them in the comment section. And then at the end of her talk, we'll loop back and ask as many of them as we can. Uh, so with that, Dr. Rebecca Johnson with Nudibranchs, they'll steal your heart and their praise defenses. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Laurel. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so excited to talk with you about nudibranchs today. Um, so this is just my contact information if you want to find me on Twitter or send me a note. Um, so I wanted to talk about my first experience um, with nudibranchs, really. Um, when I was a senior in college, I was lucky enough to do a field course here in French Polynesia, um, which is the island chain that includes Tahiti. This is an island called Morea, and I spent just about two months here when I was a senior in college and I um, did a project on nudibranchs um, and I was trying to understand their color, their defenses um, and figure out if fish would avoid them because of their color. Um, but my project that I had intended to do kind of fell through. Um, so what I ended up doing is kind of surveying the island for nudibranchs. And so I drew a lot of pictures because this was a long time ago. This is in 1994. And we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have really good underwater cameras, or at least undergraduate um, undergraduates didn't. And so I drew a ton of pictures and we also didn't have the internet like we do now. So I couldn't just like Google to figure out what I was finding. We had books um, and a little library, um, but I took lots of notes so that when I got back um, to the United States, to um, Berkeley, I would be able to figure out what I found. Um, and I found this um, little tiny slug. 
And I had, before I left, I had gone over to the California Academy of Sciences to meet with the curator of mollusks who studies nudibranchs, who's still there now, um, Dr. Terry Gosselner. And so I had talked with him before I went. And when I came back, I brought him my notebook and some pictures we had taken. And he was especially interested in this, um, this drawing that I had made because he thought this was a new species, a species that he had also found in Papua New Guinea. So we ended up working together. I joined the Academy as an undergraduate intern in the first ever undergraduate internship summer program they had. Mm -hmm. And we worked together to really understand this species. And our main goal was to describe this species and figure out how it was related to different species um, in its same genus. You can see it's like amazingly beautiful. And it's tiny, like Laura was saying, this is maybe a couple millimeters big. Um, so we ended up naming this species Hypsilodorus zephra. Hypsilodorus means high-bodied sea goddess. Doris is one of the goddesses of the sea. Um, if you could see this slug like, from the side, it actually kind of is higher. It like raises up toward the back. And this is the, oh, you guys can't see, this is the, the head. And this is the back or the, sometimes we say tail, although Terry doesn't like anyone calling it a tail. And this is, these are the gills here. And I'll talk more about their anatomy in a bit. Um, and Zephyr means warm west wind. And this species is found throughout the Indo-Pacific tropics. And describing and understanding the species really started me on the path of um, working on nudibranchs for a lot of years. Um, I ended up continuing my summer project at the academy and getting a master's and a PhD, understanding the evolutionary relationships of groups of um, the group of nudibranchs called the Chromadora nudibranchs or the colorful sea goddesses. Um, that is this includes this species and lots of its relatives. So over the past 20 years, 25 years, I guess, I've described 32 species, all super beautiful and really, really colorful and all in partnership with really um, incredible colleagues. Um, just recently, a couple of years ago, we published a paper where I was able to name a couple species after my kids, which was really um, exciting and fun. Um, but mostly, I'm my research on nudibranchs is really, I'm interested in their color patterns and how they evolve. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. As Laurel said, um, my job now is as co-director of citizen science at the California Academy of Sciences, where I'm really lucky that I get to work um, with people, volunteers from all walks of life, kids and adults and families to discover nature all around us, including nudibranchs. Um, and we make observations and we share them and we use those data to understand the natural world and to make really important conservation decisions. I get to see nudibranchs all the time, but um, mostly locally in our tide pools and Allison will talk more about our local species on Friday. So today we're gonna take a deep dive into nudibranchs. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of framing of like where, where they fall in the evolutionary tree, their evolutionary relationships, who they're related to. Um, and we're going to talk about, look at some of the diversity of the shapes of their bodies and how they live, um, what, what and how they eat. We'll talk about their reproduction, and then we'll talk about some defensive strategies. So nudibranchs are absolutely incredible. There are over 3,000 described species of nudibranchs. They're found in every ocean from shallow water to deep sea. They have their greatest diversity in the shallow tropics, like think about places like coral reefs. Um, but we have a huge diversity of nudibranchs off our coast here in California. So nudibranchs are mollusks. And when you think of mollusks, you probably think um, of things that are a little more common, maybe not so common, but things like clams and mussels and um, octopuses and cuttlefish and squid and nautilus and um, chitons which are eight shelled mollusks and then gastropods which are snails um, snails and their relatives and that's really what we're going to focus on today there are a, a few other groups of mollusks that are much less known and i'm not going to talk about those today because we don't have time but maybe we can have another um, set of a breakfast club talking about mollusks and some of the other gastropods that I won't be able to talk about today. 
So gastropods are really at their core snails and slugs. Gastropod means stomach foot because you imagine that place that the snail crawls on is their foot, but also their stomach and their guts are all close to that foot. Um, so there are a few groups. I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Our understanding of how um, gastropods are related to each other has changed a lot recently. So I'm just going to go really quickly through like things that you might think of when you think about snails. So there are a couple groups. Um, one is marine and freshwater snails and, and some land snails. And there's one group that includes things like abalone and turban snails. Another that includes maybe think of all the other marine snails you can think, all the things that you see seashells um, that make seashells that only have one opening that aren't two shells together. Um, and then limpets, which are shell-like, um, plate-like shelled um, gastropods. And then there's this group that we're going to focus on today, which includes the land, all the land snails and slugs, or most of the land sl snails and slugs and then sea slugs and their relatives. So that's what we'll focus on now. So nudibranchs are part of this group that includes land snails and slugs, a group called sea, so these are the, here's a land snail. All of us hope mostly have seen um, snails in our backyard and slugs, and there's an amazing diversity of land snails and slugs found all over the world. There's another incredible group called pteropods or sea butterflies which are pelagic, which means they never touch the ground. They're swimming all the time in the ocean. They're just amazing. And then um, sea slugs and their relatives. So this is a nudibranch, um, kind of a famous internet nudibranch, sometimes called the sea bunny because it looks a little bit like a bunny. So sea slugs. So all nudibranchs, and that's what we're going to talk about today, are sea slugs, but not all sea slugs are nudibranchs. So one of the things that makes um, a nudibranch a nudibranch is that its gills are naked. That's what nudibranch means. It doesn't have a shell. They don't have shells as an adult and their gills are open to the water. So most of their relatives that we'll talk about, some of which are also called sea slugs, have a reduced shell or an internal shell, um, but they look kind of sluggy even though they have a little shell. So there are some like this, these are called um, cephalospidians that have a shell. You can see if you imagine if you could touch this bubble part, it would be hard, the shell is inside there. Um, and species like this that also have an internal shell. Um, sea hares, which are actually the true sea bunnies because they that's what they're called, sea hares. They look a little bit like rabbits. <laughs> um, they have an internal shell. Um, this is a type of sea slug. And then um, there is a group of slugs called umbrella slugs that have a little shell kind of setting on the top like an umbrella or like a, like a mushroom. They're sometimes they're called fungids as well. They have a little mushroom top shell. And then there's another group of slugs that don't have a shell that, that um, eat algae that look like this or don't usually have a shell. Um, these are sometimes called sap, suck, sucking sea slugs because they suck, um, they pierce into algae and then suck out the insides. There are a couple species that do have shells, but this is not similar. Or it's like a secondary kind of shell, um, not the same as the shell of snails. And some um, sacoglossins or sap sucking sea slugs look like butterflies. They're just incredible like this one. And then there's a group called um, side gilled sea slugs like this. And if you look really closely, you can see here, this is its gill kind of sticking out. And these are the closest relatives to nudibranchs. And then we come to nudibranchs. Oops. And nudibranchs basically fall out into two groups that we'll talk about today. The dorids or the slugs that have a little um, circle of gills right here on their back. And then a group called the cladobranchs, which is pretty much every other kind of nudibranch. Um, and they don't have this really typical kind of gills. So I'm just going to go through some of them really briefly so you can see some that we're not going to really focus on that much today. You can see this is a type of cladobranch that has um, doesn't have a circle of gills, but has gill-like projections along the side of its body. 
much like this. This is Tritonia that has the same kind of gill-like structures along the side of its body. And um, this amazing slug as well. Um, and then there are some slugs that are also part of the cladobranchs. This is a species of melobi that I just had to show you because it's really incredible how it eats. It actually filter feeds and it grabs small crustaceans out of the water. Um, and this one is incredible and you can see a still picture here. But one of its relatives looks like this. And I know it's really hard to see, but it's sometimes called the ghost melobi because it looks like a ghost. Here is its head. And here are the, some of those projections along its back. So when you're done listening to me, Google Melody Pulmonai and take a look at this when it's moving in video because it's really, really incredible. Um, but today we're gonna focus really on two groups. Aelids, which is a kind of cladobranch. You can see here, it doesn't have a circle of gills on its back. It just has these projections. And then, um, Dorids, which are these nudibranchs with a circle of gills here, and they're rhinophores, and we'll talk more about their parts in a second. And look at the front. So sometimes there are dorids that fool you. This looks like it doesn't have a circle of gills, but it actually does. If you look right here, it has a circle of gills there, and these projections are not are, are a little different than in some of those other species. I just wanted to show you this moving around because it's really beautiful. All right, so Laurel and I talked a little bit about the sizes of nudibranchs when we um, first started. And most slugs, most nudibranchs are quite small, you know, a few inches or smaller, but some are quite large. So this is a species called the Spanish Ganther. You, know, you can't really tell sometimes in these underwater photos without scale, but here you can see Bruce Wright took these pictures about 20 years ago. But you can see how big this slug is, a couple feet probably. Um, compared to the divers in this photo. And the Spanish dancer is especially amazing because it also swims as a defensive mechanism um, to get away from predators. Obviously this one's a little smaller than two feet, but um, you can see how they swim to escape their predators. Um, but nudibranchs, like we said, can be quite small. This one is, you know, just a big, maybe the size of two little grains of rice. Um, and, um, you know, when you, like I said, when you see amazing pictures of nudibranchs like this, you know, it looks like maybe it's, it's pretty big, right? But I wanted to show you what this looks like when you see it in the tide pools from far away. And um, you can see this is that same species here, um, kind of tucked away. And this is a sea urchin for scale. And Allison on Friday will talk a little bit more about what this looks like when you're finding nudibranchs in the field. So I just wanted to go through, start with some basic anatomy. I know I've touched on some terms um, for parts of nudibranchs, but I wanted to use this beautiful, kind of simple nudibranch as a way to explain the parts of the body. So these are the gills. Um, so remember, nudibranchs means naked gills. In most other gastropods, the gills are hidden under the shell um, or, or some other part of the body, and that these gills are out in the open. Um, so the door of nudibranchs have this flower of gills that you can always see on the back of their, um, on their back. These structures here that look like antennae, that sometimes people call antennae, are called rhinophores, which basically means smelling scent noses. Um, and they use these to sense um, their sensory organs, and they use these to sense chemicals and in the water. And nudibranchs have eyes. Most of them can just see light and dark. You can't really see the eyes in this photo, but what you can see is where these arrows are pointing, there are two kind of more translucent circles um, through the white. And the eyes are just kind of two little pigment spots that look directly up and are really good for detecting shadows, like if something is swimming over. Um, the eyes are looking up. So they can't see each other, really, and they can't see each other's colors, which is really important. And then um, nudibranchs are all simultaneous hermaphrodites. That means they have both male and female reproductive organs at the same time, and they have one reproductive opening on the right side of their body. And we'll talk more about that when we get to reproduction. So nudibranchs are grazers, not like this, 
kind of grazer. They're grazers, kind of a little bit more like cows, except think about them as grazing carnivores because they don't graze on plants or algae, they graze on other animals, other animals that don't move. And there isn't a really good um, analogy for things on land. There aren't many animals that don't move at all that are grazed on by predators. But nudibranchs um, and all mo most mollusks except for clams um, have what's called a radula. And they use this radula or tongue of teeth that you can see here, this tongue of teeth. They can push it out of their mouth and it's covered with little teeth that can scoop up their food, that can scoop up their food and put it, bring it back into their mouth. So I have a couple other pictures. Here's kind of a close up. If you imagine here's the radula or that tongue of teeth. Um, it is rubbing against their food and grabbing little pieces of it and bringing it into their mouth. This is kind of what it looks like if you're looking right into the mouth of the slug and you can see all the little teeth here. So I have a little video, it's a little fast speed, but if you imagine this is a snail, this is not a nudibranch, but this is a snail on the side of an aquarium and it's pushing out its tongue of teeth here, scraping the glass um, to pick up its food. So, and we've actually, most of us have probably seen some evidence of this, right? Here's a garden snail. And even if you don't see garden snails in your garden, you often see the results of them eating their plants with their radula as they're scraping the plant. So this is what a nudibranch radula from one species that I've worked on looks like. It's quite tiny. It's maybe a couple millimeters across. Um, and this is the tongue of teeth. And if you look, and I'll show you some close-up pictures of the actual teeth. And like I said, um, nudibranchs are carnivores and they use that radula to eat other animals, animals that don't move. So here's an example of a door of nudibranch and eating a sponge. So this, all this pink and purple stuff is a sponge, which is a type of animal. And they have teeth that are, that are perfect for scraping bits of sponge into their mouth. Other nudibranchs eat different animals. And so here is an animal called a bryozoan or a moth animal. It looks kind of like, just like a crust on rock. But if you look more closely, it has these little tiny, um, they look like they're like little polyps. They're called um, zoids. They're sticking out of the tiny little holes on that bryozoan. And the nudibranchs that eat bryozoans have different teeth, or different shaped teeth that are really good for scraping up bryozoans. And other slugs eat corals and anemones and their relatives. Here are some hydroids, a relative of um, sea anemones and jellyfish. And, there, and slugs that eat these have specialized teeth that they use to grab individual polyps and eat them. Um, and one thing that's really important to remember is all of these animals, all of these encrusting animals, these animals that don't move, that are the, the prey of nudibranchs, they're kind of sitting ducks for predators, right? They can't move. So many of them are defended by different chemicals to protect them against generalist predators, predator, predators that kind of eat anything. And many nudibranchs have, are specialized predators and they'll just eat a couple things. And so they've evolved ways to deal with the chemical defenses of their prey and it's kind of like an arms race, an evolutionary arms race between specialized predators and the prey that can't move to, to get, get around those defenses of the prey and then for the prey to beef up their defenses to protect them against um, specialized predators. And some nudibranchs like this Gymnodorus eat other nudibranchs. So you can see this one here is eating a little um, Hypsilodorus or Chromodorid and they have these really sharp daggery teeth that they use to eat other nudibranchs. So that is eating and feeding, and we'll talk a tiny bit more about the um, defenses and um, the strategies that a couple different kinds of nudibranchs have to get around their prey's defenses. But I first wanted to talk about reproduction. Um, so here is a picture of two um, slugs in the genus Hypsilodorus mating. 
And you can see, like I said, they have this reproductive opening on the right side. So when they meet, they join up their reproductive opening um, and they basically swap sperm. So each one gives sperm to the other and each one receives sperm and their eggs are fertilized and then they develop inside each of the nudibranchs. The nudibranchs are tiny and pretty rare or sparse. Um, when you go looking for them, they're not usually really, really abundant. And so one of the things that being able to mate with any other individual you find, one thing that helps is that any individual you find it when someone when your potential mates are kind of rare, um, when you do meet up, you can mate with any other um, member of your same species that you encounter. So here's a picture of a to um, a different nudibranchs on um, teratosoma mating. And then once um, the eggs are fertilized, they're laid out into an egg ribbon. And the ribbons look really different. Um, they're really specific, like different species have different ribbons that look different. Um, you can see a close up here. So this is really just imagine like a, a ribbon attached to the surface on its thin edge. And then if you could look closely at the ribbon, it's filled with tiny, tiny little eggs. Like I said, different species have different shaped egg ribbons. You can see this Gymnodorus has like a little thin, um, like thin string of eggs that kind of lays messily along the bottom. I have a grudge against these guys because they eat Chromodorus or Hypsodorus. That's why I call their not as messy, even though they're quite beautiful. Um, you can see here's another um, Goniobranchus that's laying its eggs in a big, big spiral. Um, and another species of Hypsodorus laying its eggs here, the yellow part that you can see here are the eggs. And so um, this is a close-up of an egg mass, and this um, you can see each tiny little egg develops into what we call a veliger, a veliger larva, larval form, like a little larva. And this is the only time that nudibranchs have a shell when they're in their larval form. You can see them little, little closely, little close size here. They have, here's a close up picture of what it would look like. They have a shell here, a spiral shell. Um, after they've spent time in the egg mass, there, the egg mass breaks down and then these guys swim in the plankton. And so they have these little lobes here that they use to swim um, through the plankton until they settle and then metamorphose or change completely into the adult um, slugs that we see. So um, in the plankton, there are tons of other um, components of plankton, lots of larvae of lots of different marine invertebrates. And there, are, this is full of, when you, if you took a scoop of water and looked at it under uh, ocean water and looked at it under a microscope, you would see larvae, you would see diatoms, you would see things that spend all of their life in the plankton. And nudibranch and other snail, village or larva are an important part of plankton, of the plankton. All right, so I'm gonna tell you now two stories about um, two different ways that nudibranchs take the defenses of their prey for themselves. And the first one is kind of generalized to those, to aelid nudibranchs, which are one of the cladobranchs, the species that don't, the group of animals that don't have the gills on the back, but instead um, their, their gut, so here's the mouth, their gut extends all the way into these structures called serrata that are on their back and that they actually diffuse or breathe across the really thin area here of their serrata. So they don't have specialized gills, they just exchange oxygen across their body surface. But what's really important about these guys is you can see their gut extends all the way into these serrata. And these guys, this is a species um, we can find off our coast called Hermosinda opalescens. They eat hydroids and anemones and um, cnidarians, so corals, anemones, hydroids, and their relatives. All cnidarians have special stinging cells. Oh, wait, let me go back, sorry. They do have special stinging cells, but hold that thought. I wanna show you a close-up picture of the extension of the gut. So you can see in this species, you can see if you look really closely at those serrata, you can see how the gut extends all the way right to the edge of those serrata. 
Okay, so these guys eat anemones, like this, you can see this Aelidia eating this anemone here. All anemones, all of them, have specialized stinging cells called nematocysts. And these stinging cells are absolutely incredible. If you've ever touched a sea anemone um, or a coral, but sea anemone, like a sea anemone, and you touch it and it feels a little bit sticky, like tape, that is all of the anemones nematocysts firing like this, like little harpoons and sticking onto your finger. They're really trying to catch prey because they can't move either, or even if they can move, they have to catch their prey somehow, and they use these nematocysts to catch their prey. Here's some close-up amazing images of what these nematocysts look like, a little coiled up harpoon in one little cell. So in nudibranchs, when these aelid nudibranchs eat the cnidarians, they take these tiny little nematocysts and they keep them in their gut and they put them into the extensions of their gut, into their serrata, and they use them for their own defense. So they're able to have those nematocysts not fire and keep them in a, a state that's ready to fire um, and they use them against their potential predators um, the way the anemone would have tried, was hoping to use it against its predators. So most halids that do this get their nematocysts directly from their cnidarian prey, but some eat other halids and take the stinging cells from the other halids into their extension of their gut. Um, and some of these are uh, like species we might be, be uncommon and common. Like there's this amazing pelagic slug, um, Glaucus, right here that lives only that swims and is only found in um, op the open ocean. And it eats um, this by the wind sailor, which maybe some people have seen washed up on our beaches. Um, it eats the tentacles here down at the bottom of the by the wind sailor and takes the nematocysts from these guys for its own defense. And maybe more common to people is the Portuguese man o' war um, and Glaucus can also take this eat and take the stinging cells from the, the Portuguese man o' war for its own defense. And the other thing that some aelids can do is that since they eat anemones and corals that have um, a symbiotic dinoflagellate called zooxanthellae or zochlorelli, so corals and some anemones have these symbionts that help them um, take the, when the symbiont is living inside the coral or the anemone, they photosynthesize and give the products of photosynthesis to, to the coral and the anemone. That's why coral reefs can grow so big and huge is because they get extra nutrition from their symbionts. So these symbionts that are living in the corals and the, the anemones, some species of nudibranchs can also take those um, symbionts and keep them um, photosynthesizing in their own tissues. Um, which is quite incredible. So not only can they steal the defenses of their prey, they can also steal some of the energy making and um, the things that photosynthesize and give energy to their prey and take the energy for themselves. All right, so I have one more story that I'm gonna tell that is about some of my work and some of the, um, the chromodora nudibranchs or the colorful dora nudibranchs that I spent a lot of my career working on. So these slugs, like this one here, eat sponges. The sponges might not look like animals, but they are. And you can see this guy is not only using its radula, but sticking out its oral tube to eat this sponge. So sponges are defended by a wide array of compounds that keep um, things from settling on them. So like antimicrobial or antibacterial um, compounds and other toxins. And some nudibranchs, when they eat those sponges, they can take those chemicals, those toxins, and put them into their own tissues to protect themselves from their predator. Um, this species here, Catalina um, luteo marginata, actually doesn't just take those chemicals as they are, it actually modifies those chemicals to make them more toxic. And one of the ways that some slugs do this is when they eat 
the chemical. They'll actually change the chemical structure as the chemical is moving through their body to put some of the really like toxic functional groups to kind of hide those and protect themselves from it. And then when they get it to a place in their body like that is good for defense, They'll change it and make it even more toxic. And chromodorids are especially amazing um, at this. They have specialized glands that you can see here, if you look closely, around the outside, oops, the outside of their body, you can see they have these little, um, these little glands that they hold the toxins in. So not only do they take the toxins from their sponge prey, they put them in specialized glands that are just for holding these toxins around the edges of their bodies, the places that are, you know, if a predator was to bite them, wouldn't it wouldn't matter as much as some of their more sensitive parts. So um, nudibranchs, who eats nudibranchs is kind of up for debate. There aren't a lot of studies that show actual predation on nudibranchs. But we know that, they, that fish will eat nudibranchs and, oops, and crabs um, and their relatives like stomatopods, so visual predators, will eat nudibranchs. Um, and so the, the, we know that, like I just said, some of these nudibranchs are protected by chemicals that they've gotten from their prey and they're protected from these visual predators. Um, so there are a couple ways to protect yourself from visual predators. Um, one is to be super camouflaged, like this nudibranch here. You can see here it matches perfectly to this like, sponge prey. Its eggs even match perfectly there. Um, and so whether you're toxic or not, um, you can use camouflage as one way to hide from predators. Um, if you have some chemical defenses, um, that could still help you if you are found out. But um, the chromodorids, like these here, kind of go a different way, right? They have these really, really bright color patterns. Um, and the theory is that these color patterns help warn predators. They're really memorable, and they warn predators to stay away. Like, don't eat me. I taste terrible. Um, and because they're kind of rare or sparse, like I said, um, if a predator doesn't encounter or run into a colorful nudibranch very often, it might not learn very quickly that the nudibranch tastes terrible. But if it encountered it more, um, it might learn more quickly. And so that's a theory behind things like this group of species here, which is called a mimicry ring, where these species that are not super closely related to each other share a color pattern. Um, possibly because it's helping their predators learn to avoid this color pattern. Because if you eat this, it will taste terrible and you won't, you won't have wanted to eat it. Um, so I was really, when I first started studying these slugs, I was really interested in how this happens um, and what we can say about this because we didn't really have a family tree or a way to understand um, the relationships between species that share a common color pattern. Because it could be that species um, have a common color pattern because their common ancestor had this color pattern. Like they're all red, they all have red spots and a yellow border. And I was especially interested in this group here. So if you look in this photo, you can see two slugs right here that share a common color pattern, kind of. They have some elements that are in common. They have these three lines, instead of three lines. These two species are each other's closest relatives, and um, they're now called Mexichromis, and they um, share this color pattern, most likely because their common ancestor also had this, this color pattern. But if you look closely, there's a third nudibranch in this picture. Do you see this one here? And this one is not closely related to these two, and it shares its pattern with only one of them. And then there are some other slugs, this one, and this one, and these that all share elements of that color pattern. Um, and I was really interested to know if they have this color pattern because they're closely related and they've, they evolved it because they have a common ancestor, 
or if there's some pressure from predators to help them that help them converge on this color pattern to give them more protection. So I'm not going to talk about all all the details. But what I found, this is a family tree of all of the chromodorid nudibranch. And this is not showing all of my bits, but all of these different color patterns, um, the similar color pattern has evolved multiple times across this, the evolutionary history of this group. Um, and all of these species that have the same color pattern are not each other's closest relatives, but um, live in the same place. And the you know, the idea is that the predators have learned to avoid this pattern um, because they encounter it more often um, across the different groups. But this isn't always true. So there's another group of slugs um, in the in the genus Goniobranchus that all kind of look the same. And if you could see them crawling, they all can flip up their mantle and it's bright purple underneath. And it turns out for this group, all of them, all of the slugs that have the same kind of color pattern and this purple flocking are all each other's closest relatives. So it's not always the same method. Um, sometimes the color is just because your relatives have that same color as you do. So I've talked a little bit about the, the mimicry and the color pattern, um, the sharing of color patterns within nudibranchs. So nudibranchs that all have toxins from their, their sponge prey um, converging on a common color pattern to fool predators. But the last thing I wanted to talk about was other species that, that mimic nudibranchs. So you can see this nudibranch here. Um, this is an incredible species called Goniobranchus fidelis. And you can see, if you look closely, you can see the mantle glands around the edge. That's where it puts those toxins um, from its sponge prey. But this is a marine flatworm. And you can see that the marine flatworm and the slug share a common color pattern. Um, and again, not much research has been done on this, but the idea is that this flatworm um, and the nudibranch, the flatworm has converged on the nudibranch color pattern to help protect itself. And one of the things, like if you are on Twitter and following nudibranch hashtags or looking for GIFs or anything, there are so many that are actually marine flatworms that are labeled as nudibranchs. I think I might do a quiz on Twitter um, this week to do a, is this a flatworm or is this a nudibranch quiz? Um, so be on the lookout for that. But I wanted to show you a couple more examples. And um, here's another slug. You see the gills here. So the ways to tell, I'll give you guys little pointers, are the circle of gills here, the rhinophores, that are like real rhinophores kind of move back from the edge of the mantle. This is a flatworm that looks very similar. And here's another example where here's the slug, right? You can see the gill here and the rhinophore here. And here's the flatworm. And you can see that this one even has like up here, it has some structures that it's, it's making look like rhinophores but they aren't rhinophores. Um, so here's just some other, um, these all together. And I wanted to show you one of the gifts I found when you put nudibranch in the search bar. So this is not a nudibranch. It's swimming like the Spanish dancer a little bit, but this is a marine flatworm. And if you look closely, you can see it doesn't have any gills. It's kind of flat. And it's kind of making the edges here of its, body look like rhinophores, but they're not rhinophores. So um, I hope you all have enjoyed um, these little stories. There are like hundreds more stories that I could tell in more detail, but I wanted to just give you a little taste um, of what these incredible animals can do, um, what they eat, um, how they mate, and some of the tricks they use to take their predators' defenses for their own defense. Um, and I just wanted to remind you, these are all nudibranchs that you can find right off our coast here um, off in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, Allison Young will talk about these species and how to find them. And once we can all get to the beach safely, um, how to look for these um, when you're out at the beach. And with that, I'd be happy to bring Laurel back and take some questions.
Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that was that was so the, that was so good like every I think like probably everybody out there was doing the same thing that I was which is just every slide you're just like whoa whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah it's unbelievable um and actually so this uh YouTube user she wish you a tiger didn't have a question but he did say he or she sorry did say something that um that I think we should all acknowledge as profound which is love is stored in the nudibranch <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Not only the store toxins and stinging cells, but love. And love. Right? I mean, it seems like all those things go together anyway. So. They seem to go together, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a human <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm going to start with a question from Jackie, who's eight. And in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that you had described, I think, was it 32 species? Yeah, I think it's 32. Okay. Yeah. And she asked, does described mean the same as discovered? Oh, that's a really good question, Jackie. And I want to give a shout out to a bunch of other eight-year-olds that I know are watching. So my daughter's class, um, Room 201, this um, class is watching. So <laughs> for all the eight-year-olds out there. Um, so no, it doesn't actually. And so I, the one that I told you the story about, like I actually found that while I was snorkeling and it didn't have a name. So the first thing to remember though, is that the people living in Morea or in Tahiti who lived there for thousands and thousands of years probably knew about this nudibranch way before me, right? So I didn't discover it. Um, that knowledge was held by people for centuries. Um, but I was the first one to find it and recognize it didn't have like a Western scientific name. And then Terry, my advisor and mentor, did the same. Um, and then we were able to give it a formal name in a process, um, like a scientific process. There's a formal way you give something a name that with a genus and a species, like Hypsilodorus zephra. Like for humans, it's Homo sapiens. Um, so we get to choose the name based on a bunch of rules and our understanding of relationships. Um, so I got to describe it in a formal way. And then for most of the other species that I described, I didn't actually discover them, but Terry did or other um, scientists and researchers that we work with all over the world that make collections and send them to natural history museums so we can build up a library of life on earth. And many of those things don't have formal scientific names. So, you know, the when I get back to the Academy of Sciences building in our collections, there are thousands of specimens that don't have formal scientific names that have been discovered by someone else. The description is just part of the process. And when you give something a name, you get to choose what the name is. Um, you can't name it after yourself. There are some rules, um, but you can name them after other people. Um, a lot of people, like the person that did find it um, and give and show it to scientists first. Um, or a lot of people believe that you should give names that are descriptive, that help you understand something about it, like the color or what it looks like, um, to just be more helpful. Mm -hmm. I think the names that you mentioned at the beginning were all pretty, I, what was the high-waisted, high-waisted High body, the high body. High body. So yeah, Hypsilodorus, and because they're <laughs> called Dorids, which is a name of a goddess, the high bodied name um, is what that genus is called. And um, when I was doing some of my work, I got to I figured out some new relationships, and I had a chance to decide if I should make a new genus name, which is like more than just a species name, or if I should just use old names that already existed. And I chose to use old names to just be kind of consistent. Mm -hmm. So I've never named a genus, but mm -hmm. um, I've named species. But yeah, you get to, you know, you can take out a Latin or um, Greek dictionary or any, you can use any words that you want. So you can use um, any language and you just usually have to Latinize the, the ending. So mm -hmm. like for my kids, like my daughter's name is Juniper. And so her, the knit species I named after her is Juniper A because she's a girl, so it's Juniper A. So, but you can use any, um, you can almost do almost everything, anything you want, but you have to follow some rules. Yeah, I feel like after you describe 20 species, you should be, get a pass on naming one after yourself. Still like, but I guess <laughs> you can trade. Like, right. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I also like the one that was warm west wind. Like I yeah. would like to be called warm west wind. Yeah, that's right. Zephra, it's so pretty. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's nice it really one. is. I like that one. Yeah, there's some really some ones that I really really like. Like there's um there's one called Hypsilodorus iacula, which and it has a net like pattern. And iacula means net. So like there's some like really yeah. fun um, names so you can get kind of creative when you're thinking of yeah. Me. I love it. I'm going to um, dive into a bunch more questions because we did get, there's no way we'll get to all of them, but I did yeah. pull a good handful for you. Okay, um, and I I uh, have another one from Deepti, who's in third grade. Her name's Ria. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know that it's a girl. He, she, they. Uh, and she wonders, sorry, <laughs> uh, how long sea slugs live? Oh my gosh, that's a really good question. Yeah. We don't know for sure, but probably around a year. Um, as adults and maybe, mm -hmm. maybe longer. Um, one of the reasons we don't know is because if you bring nudibranchs into the lab, if you can keep their food alive, you can keep them alive for probably longer than they would live if they're in the wild. This is true right. of almost any animal that, mm -hmm. you know, if you can keep them in captivity, they generally live a little bit longer because they don't have to deal with the same stresses they have to deal with in the wild. But most slugs are probably around a year old. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a little longer. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, this one's from Jake. What are the little teeth on the medulla made out of? Mm. So they're made of chitin, Ooh, which is a frozen. little bit like, oh, oh, am I frozen? Am I better? <laughs> I don't know, but I can hear. Can you Can you hear me? Okay, good. I'm good. So Laurel's frozen. Um, so they're made out of chitin, which is kind oh, of like your internet thing that we're all struggling with. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. So there it's kind of like the same material that your fingernails are made of, actually. Um, so it's just a protein, kind of a hardened protein. So I think Laurel might be frozen. If I'm not frozen, I can. Um, I, I can hear I can you again it. now. Yay. I think this is going to. Okay, we're here. We we're talking. <laughs> Going, Rebecca. <laughs> I can hear you now. So, um, oh, good. Christina might put up a question too, um, if she has other questions. Yep, I can also paste all mine in there for her as a backup. Oh, here I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen then i can make you guys bigger and i can see the questions too um oh my gosh this is such a good question from jeanette about predators on the is their visual spectrum similar to ours and do the prey look the same to us as they do like to the vi colors that we see is that the same as what predators see and there's a group of researchers in australia that is doing some really great work looking at visual systems of predators and looking at the slugs in their natural habitat, like some of the pictures that I've showed you are like a little bit staged, right? So they look really pretty um, and isolated. And so um, they're trying to figure out what parts of the color pattern the predators see um, and maybe like get a better handle on how we're, might be misinterpreting their patterns based on our visual systems. Um, so there's some really cool work, kind of similar to what um, if you've ever seen like the difference between what we see and what bees see um, and flowers. Um, so people are trying to figure it out now um, because all of those predators and the color and color vision underwater is different than it is in the air. Um, so people are working on that now, but it's a really good question. Um, 
Okay, so then I see like a question from Stuart that Laurel put in the chat is which nudibranchs are on my bucket list? Oh my gosh. Okay, the one that is on my bucket list, and I mean, you guys might be amazed. There is a species that's found in California that's called Babakina festiva um, that is like this pink alid that the serrata on its back kind of look like candy corn. And it's found in Southern California pretty regularly, but every once in a while it gets up to the place that um, Allison and I do our field work with our amazing group of volunteers. And I've never seen it. I get pictures, like people send me terrible cell phone pictures, like taken from like 20 feet away to ask me to ID them. And then I go back to that same space and I look around for days and I can never find it. So Babakina Festiva is like the number one on my list to find. Um, and then there are just a lot of species that, that I've described from specimens that I haven't seen alive um, that I would love to see. Um, and so that takes tra traveling um, to the tropics and um, spending a lot of time underwater. Um, but I'm really excited when I see um, species here because I'm more of a tide pooler than a, than a diver. Um, so I like to be on land and be able to find them because it seems extra magical that you can only find them at low tide. Um, here, there's another question um, from Sarah asking, do nudibranchs always mate with others of the same species when they meet since their meetings are rare? So yes. Sarah, there, we don't have evidence of um, species that are not um, like different species mating, so inter-specific mating. We don't have any evidence of that. For a long time, there was this set of pictures, like divers would see um, two slugs that look, looked like they were different species because they had different patterns mating. And we thought at the time, this was a few years ago, that all, especially the chromodorids that I work on, that all of them were really, really consistent in their color pattern. Like one species, it always looks the same, mostly. So that's what we thought. Um, and so we have these pictures that divers had posted on Flickr and other places of species, it, what looked like two different species mating because their color pattern was really, really different. And so um, this was like a big mystery. And we finally got specimens of those um, different color patterns and did um, molecular work on the DNA to figure out what they were. And it turned out that they're actually the same species with two different patterns. And this um, is only one of, I think, two or three examples of that kind of variation um, within one species and um, things looking different. And what's really interesting is most likely the two different color patterns are part of two different mimicry complexes, right? So they each look like something else that's common around them. Um, and that one is called Hypsilodorus eba, and the name eba means like changeable or variable. And that was one we named a couple of years ago. Rebecca, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. I'll keep reading you these questions and thank you for, you hosted yourself remarkably well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Self-hosting. It's I can yeah. do it. You can do it all. Um, so Trevor <laughs> was um, the section where you talked about the gut extending into the is it serrata? Is that the right? Serrata. So it's serrata. C E R T. I can't spell out without S C E R A T A. Serrata. Okay. Serrata. So that section he asked, um, isn't it, is it, is it not risky to have your gut kind of extend that far in that many directions in terms of injury or getting nibbled on or those kinds of things? Yeah, that's a great question too. That a lot of species, um, because they have so many serrata that it's not as risky because it's not like your whole gut, it's like an extension. And some species can actually like close off their serrata and just drop them if they get damaged. Oh. So then they just close off their gut. They're like, yeah, whatever, you can have that. Like, I don't care about it. Um, kind of like a lizard tail, I guess, in some ways, yeah. right? So, um, and some, if you touch them or handle them, like, you know, they think they're being eaten, they'll drop all their serrata. Um, so then it's more work to grow them back and then to repopulate them with the, the stinging cells. But um, I think it's it's like a trade-off. Like mm -hmm. you know, you, you, some of the ones that 
yeah, you have to make a decision, like an evolutionary decision, an adaptive decision, but um, not like a conscious decision. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, they can just protect themselves by being able to drop them off. Um, and sometimes that's a strategy, right? Like, so if a predator takes your one of your serrata, you can crawl away and it's left with one of them only. Right. Okay. Um, and Darren was curious whether you know of any other organisms that can ingest and repurpose stinging cells in the way nudibranchs can. That is a good question. I don't think so. I'm not 100% sure. You know, there's a woman, um, Lisa um, Paget, who's a graduate student at the academy right now, and she's studying and defending her thesis actually in a couple weeks about um, – the acquisition of nematocysts, and mm -hmm. she might know the answer, and a bunch of my colleagues that work on um, cnidarians, right? So people that work on sea anemones might know better. I can't think of any, but mm -hmm. um, I, there might be something I'm missing, so. Right, that's a pretty cool strategy. Um, let's see, how about, Jess has a question about whether scientists uh, are looking, whether any scientists are looking into turning the compounds you mentioned in the last section into antibiotics or other medical applications for humans. Yeah, for sure. So there are a lot of people that work in natural products chemistry that are interested in nudibranchs um, and other invertebrates, you know, to figure out how you can make drugs from the different compounds that mm -hmm. these slugs make. Um, one of the issues is, is that um, you have to synthesize them in the lab and often you need a lot of the first, you need a lot of the material to figure it out. And because nudibranchs are so small and so yeah. sparse, it can be hard to um, gather enough of them, but people are able to do it. One of the things that people have done is started with the nudibranchs and then gone to their prey because usually you can get more of that. Um, but yeah, it's a very um, rich area of research is the natural products chemistry of nudibranchs and their relatives. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, Cynthia wanted to know um, whether the alids, am I saying that right? Aelids. Yeah, so alid, the, you know, I'm saying aelid. that Doris is like the goddess, and then Aeolus is actually the Greek god of wind. And so if you think about Serata like blowing in the wind, like that, it's a good way to remember it. So okay. Aelids. Aelids. Um, can the aelids that keep symbionts taken from prey also take up symbionts from seawater? Oh, like corals do, right? So corals yeah. take their symbionts from the water. I don't think so. Um, I think they have to get it through their prey or mediated through their prey. I haven't heard of it the other way, but again, folks that work on symbiodidium um, uptake and zoxanthellae um, might know better, but um, I think they have to get them from their prey. Okay. Uh, James was fascinated by that two foot sea slug you showed and asked, <laughs> yeah, so was I, is that the largest nudibranch and what does it feed on? So I, it's the largest picture of like picture that I've ever seen. And I've seen those in person, you know, like, you know, a foot long. Um, I think that nudibranchs, so things without shells at all, right. They don't have any structure that's holding them really? up right they're underwater right so the water pressure holds them and some nudibranchs have tiny little spicules in their mantle to help give them a little structure but i think that's kind of pushing the limits of how big they can be and not like flop over but um, <laughs> but some of the the sea slugs that have internal shells can be a little bit bigger so sea hares can be quite large um kind of that same size like more regularly Whoa. But yeah, there's some limits of physics um, that, you know, some species get around like octopus and things, but but it's a, just a little tough for them to get that much bigger. That's like a super anomaly. You know, I would say 90% or more are like this big. Yeah. Yeah. And what was that big guy feeding on? Oh, you know, I'm pretty sure the Hexabranchus um, feed is a sponge feeder. Okay. But again, I'm not a, I'm nine, I'm pretty sure, but. I have to look it up, but because okay. they're like literally one of the most popular nudibranchs, they're called Spanish dancers. You guys could Google it too. And I'm sure you could find out what it eats, but it's called hexabranchus because it has um, its gills on its back. Like the gills of most doors, um, when they pull them, they can pull them into one pocket, like to protect them. And hexabranchus has like separate pockets. Oh, it's amazing. It's been a little bit of an enigma, like what it's actually related to, but people yeah. are 
we kind of figured it out. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Um, how K Kelly asks, how long do nudibranchs stay in a larval form before they settle? Is it dependent on age or how fast they grow or location or conditions? Yeah, so um, it depends on conditions for sure. So mm -hmm. some, actually some of those pictures that I showed you, there are some nudibranchs that actually develop in the in the ribbon and then just change right there and then crawl away. They're called direct developers. Um, that's kind of rare too, but um, most of them that have a planktonic larval stage probably stay actually for in the plankton for a pretty short time. And they're, they need a cue though to tell them like this is a good place to land and grow up. And what we understand about the cues is that it's like one of two things or a combination. So one would be presence of adults of the same species because it's like, oh, that adult is doing well there. I could survive there um, or the presence of their prey. So things that they can sense, um, you know, chemically sense. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the currents and like how far they travel to get back to um, places that the conditions are right. And um, there's some really cool studies, you know, from the from the 70s actually that showed, you know, the larva um, can travel really, really far and a lot of times never settle. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, you know, I talked about how nudibranchs are pretty rare, but they have so many babies like in that tiny little ribbon, right? So there are thousands. And so, you know, I've always thought that there's a chance that nudibranchs are just a really important food source in the plankton um, for other things. And a lot of their babies get eaten and they can go, you know, there's some studies that showed tropical species, you know, from, you know, um, I don't know, let's say Indonesia, their larva like being found off the coast of South America, which is like super weird. But because it got trapped in currents and never settled, um, they can live for quite some time. And some can feed in the plankton where they can eat other things and some mm -hmm. don't feed at all in the plankton. And um, so there are a lot of um, variables to how long you might stay in your planktonic form. Right. And just like in terms of the just crazy diversity and crazy colors and crazy patterns and everything else, like I know we see some stunning, beautiful examples of that just with reef features in general, but it mm -hmm. seems, is it, are nudibranchs kind of outliers in, t in terms of just that crazy diversity or and is there any th are there any theories about that or just how do we think about their their amazing range of colors yeah i think that um they might have one of the biggest ranges of colors i mean reef fishes of course have like yeah. an amazing diversity of colors um but yeah i mean for one group i mean there but, but that might be there are, there are probably like 70,000 ish um species of gastropods. My cat is knocking stuff over. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, you know, there are thousands of species. It might just be that, that, that when we think about like one, one group that they have a really big variation, like within that group mm -hmm. more than other groups. Um, but yeah, I think that, that that's one of the big questions. And one of the things that makes them really interesting is to understand why, like, is it the fact that they have these toxins that's allowed them to kind of enter this space that other things couldn't enter, kind of like butterflies. Like if you think about how diverse and colorful butterflies are, um, it's really different than a lot of other yeah. insects. And so um, yeah. is it because we sometimes we call it a key innovation, like they had something that allowed them to enter this new kind of wild space of color and, and shape um, that protects them from some of the, the predation or other um, things that would limit their right. ability to be successful. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'll ask you, I'll ask just two more and then I'll set you free before your cat like really has enough. Um, I think it's okay right now. <laughs> uh, so Kent asked a question about, I'm gonna try this, Chromodoridae, Chromodoridae? Chromodoridae, like the family. Oh, that sounds a lot cooler, okay. <laughs> Um, are there diff any differences between taxa that utilize camouflage versus those that don't in terms of assimilating bioactive compounds from sponge prey? So you might have to break that down a bit, but. Yeah, so I, the question is, I mean, is whether or not, I mean, generally whether or not there's a difference in like how chemically defended like a camouflage species would be or a camouflage group relative to a really brightly colored group. Mm -hmm. And um, in the chromodorids, there aren't a ton of camouflaged 
groups, actually. They're all, I mean, we think, right, based on the other question about vision, right? Like maybe they're totally camouflaged and we're just kind of wrong. Right. Um, but the the species that do, that are more camouflaged are, are kind of like nested within the evolutionary tree of the really brightly colored ones. So usually they're pretty chemically defended as well. Mm -hmm. Um, when I first started working on chromodorids, actually for my dissertation, one of the questions I had was um, was about the chromodorids, which are super diverse, right? Like hundreds and hundreds of species and really brightly colorful. Um, their sister group, so like their closest group of relatives is actually really drably colored and super camouflaged. And so I was interested in this question, like, well, I was interested in whether or not there was, was it this like mantle gland thing that allowed them to, the chromodorids to diversify compared to their, their relatives. Um, it turned out that like who they're actually rel related to was really different than what we had thought. <laughs> so it was hard to answer that question explicitly, but, um, but I think, yes, the camouflage species are also usually defended, especially the sponge feeders. Okay. Um, it would be really cool to do like a survey, right, of all of them and really think about the, the relative toxicity um, or mimicry um, and think about and find out really to really answer Ken's question. Um, yeah. But it looks like the camouflage things, at least in the chromodorids, are also chemically defended. It's a really good okay. answer. For yeah. <laughs> no, it's cool. It's cool. Um, let's see. So this, I thought this was a nice question from Jeanette as well and she basically is asking i'm going to sum it up but basically she's just asking do nudibranchs color do nudibranchs predators see them the same way we do in terms of those colors and patterns yeah so so we're not 100 percent sure right so we we're still trying to figure out um what the predators all of the predators see um so we know that fish have some different vision and that crabs might as well, but um, some other visual predators, other crustaceans might see a lot more similarly to us, um, or even more in depth than we do, like a wider range of colors like stomatopods. Um, so yeah, there is an active research group that is working on predator vision and, pre and color and really seeing and trying to match our understanding of these mimicry complexes, these different color patterns, and what predators see. So it's kind of like an active area of research. And yeah, I mean, one of the things that I hope kind of came through is that like, there's a lot we don't know about new brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, you know, all of your questions are all possible areas of research because we right. don't know a ton. Um, you know, there are still tons of species that are undescribed that we don't know about. Um, and that's kind of the tip of the iceberg for understanding all of these questions is giving things names and knowing what's one species versus another species and how they kind of fit into this landscape. I mean, that's kind of the work of natural history museums and right. that, um, that kind of work is open for anybody to pursue, right? I mean, there are all these questions that still need to be answered. Yeah, we love the, we love the ones we don't know answers to as much as we- <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much for letting us keep you that long. Sure, um, it was fun. And there's a lot of questions we didn't get back to. And if you asked one of those, we will try to loop back in comments and just kind of keep answering them there. Um, and, you know, we also got a lot of questions. Let's see, like Aurelia and KFI asked things like, where are the best places to see nudibranchs in the Bay yeah. Area? What types are most common? And those are why you want to come back here Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, because part two of this nudibranch. Um, this new to bring series will be Allison Young, and who was with Rebecca on our episode about um, citizen science. And she's gonna come back and answer those questions specifically. She's gonna take you virtually tide pooling and um, it should be like really good as well. And she's also a remarkable photographer. So we get some good Yeah, and all of her, I've seen her talk and all of her um, pictures are pictures she took from here. So oh, awesome. pictures you also could take um, from yeah. here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you everyone who tuned in. We'll see you Friday. And Rebecca, thank you so much again. Come back again. I will. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have Bye. a good day. You too.